stepping into the courtroom, you know the score. Only one thing matters, getting your client off the hook. So if the facts are on your side, you pound them. If not, you pound the table. Only the more you keep pounding, something unexpected happens. It all comes into focus. Everything starts to make sense. Because you know, it didn't go down the way the prosecution's claiming. There are too many gaps, too many things that don't add up. And now the facts are on your side and you're ready to pound the table into smithereens. And you're staring, eyes as big as saucers, at a premise that once seemed impossible. He didn't do it. This week, Brian Koberger's defense team announced they plan to prove their client wasn't even at the scene of the crime. Could they actually get him off? Join me for a read-along of Howard Blum's The Eyes of a Killer, Part 5, July 29th, 2023. Fear commands Brian Koberger's defense team, a relentless fear. The three lawyers, all paid by the state of Idaho, to ensure that the indigent suspect will be well represented, labor with the knowledge that their client's life is on the line. Koberger, a 28-year-old graduate student in criminology, is scheduled to stand trial beginning on October 2nd for the vicious murder of four University of Idaho students, Madison, Kaylee, Zana, and Ethan. Last month, the prosecution announced with sober resolve that, quote, considering all evidence currently known, the state felt, quote, compelled to seek the death penalty. And weeks later, the state legislator passed a law ensuring that the in the aftermath of the seemingly inevitable guilty verdict, justice would not be deprived of its pound of flesh. If the requisite cocktail of chemicals for a lethal intravenous drip proved unavailable, the law decreed that a firing squad would be rounded up to get the deed done. With this specter haunting Brian Koberger's world, his lawyers have been diligent. They have pounded the courthouse table with motions, a rat-a-tat of demands for discovery, objections to protective orders, even a curious request for the personnel files of three of the cops who played a role in helping to clamp the cuffs on Koberger. It's a seemingly desperate strategy that has left the Moscow, Idaho authorities bemused. At least that is what I'm hearing, albeit in whispered confidences, quickly muttered in dark corners, the judge in the case having issued a draconian gag order in the second floor detective shack of the Moscow Police Department building. The mood is, I'm told, haughty and confident. S-O-D-D-I. The cops taunt derisively. Some other dude did it. How many times have they heard that? And how did those cases work out? We got our man, they insist. And there's no way he's going to wiggle out of this. And the facts, as they're enumerated by law enforcement with glee, sure seem to bolster this argument. For starters, and maybe finishers too, there's the 51 terabytes of ostensibly confirming data that prosecution has handed over with sly relish to the defense. It includes, according to court filings, thousands of pages of discovery, thousands of photographs, hundreds of hours of recordings, many gigabytes of electronic phone records and social media data. And how big is 51 terabytes? Well, you might as well be counting the grains of sand on a beach. The mischievous bottom line is that it'll keep the already inundated defense busy for a while and then some. 
But if that's not sufficient, to convince the Idaho prison warden to hurry up and get his order in for the chemicals that give the execution hemlock its lethal bite, the local authorities insist they have more aces up their sleeve. But if that's not sufficient to convince the Idaho prison warden to hurry up and get his order in for the chemicals that give the execution hemlock its lethal bite, the authorities insist they have more aces up their sleeve. For one persuasive item, there's the DNA on the button of the knife sheath, found partially lying under Maddie Mogan, which matches Koberger's, according to the prosecution. For another, there's a video of a white Hyundai Elantra, similar to the suspects, tearing away from the King Road murder scene in the gray pre-dawn November morning at approximately the time the murders occurred. And for still another, there's the cell phone tower tracking data just before 3 a.m. As Koberger leaves his apartment on the night of the murders, he apparently powers down. Then at nearly 5 a.m., about an hour after the murders, his phone springs back to life just south of Moscow. In a cop's distrustful world where there are no accidents, this timeline is damned incriminating. And then there's the clincher. In fact, cop after cop promises me that it'll be the single unshakable reason Koberger will be sent by the state to his richly deserved death. Bill Thompson, the county prosecutor. Thompson, his long white biblical beard flailing about as the wind roars over the Palouse. Thompson, in his down-home uniform of jeans and fleece vests. Thompson, the wry musician who plays rock, folk, country, and even klezmer. Thompson, who had been in office for over 30 years. Thompson, who had famously done the impossible in the closely followed Rachel Anderson murder case and won a conviction without the body ever being found. An improbable victory that sent no less a culprit than a blood relative of Al Capone to jail for life. Rumor has it this will be Thompson's last hurrah. There's no way the cops believe that he'd retire to idle away his days strumming his guitar and casting his fishing rod without having secured his already impressive reputation with a final victory in a big trial. And trials just don't come any bigger than this in Lataw County. So people in Moscow will tell you, let the defense file all the Hail Mary motions they want. They're clutching at straws, howling against the wind, case closed. Or is it? Because for a supposedly open and shut case, it sure is starting to seem a lot more open than shut. At least that's what the defense team is excitedly whispering to each other, according to several people privy to their deliberations. Give the state's much vaunted evidence a couple of good swift kicks and it'll break apart. That's what these defense sources energized by a triumphant sense of an extraordinary upset in the making they are sharing with me. The DNA, it's touch. That is from skin cells, not blood. Grounds for suspicion. Not a one-way ticket to the execution chamber. The car videos, there's no image of the driver in any of them. And there's not a single shot that displays the license plate. Nothing that definitively puts Koberger at the wheel or demonstrates beyond a reasonable doubt that it was his car. After all, there are a lot of Hyundai Elantras on the road besides Koberger's. The cell tower triangulation? That's one part wishful thinking to another part of junk science. Peel away the well-documented limitations of the process, and Koberger's phone could have been placed anywhere within 13-mile radius of the murder house. And that's about as definitive as a suspicion, not a certainty. And for the wily Bill Thompson, well, the wags say, the Biden presidency makes one truth uncomfortably clear. Experience is just another word for old. And there was redder meat for the defense to sink their teeth into. With an attention-grabbing oratorical drumroll, defense sources enumerate the large, lingering mysteries 
the prosecution has refused to address. And they very pointedly make the case that these inconvenient truths, when lined up end to end, hint at each other. Still untold story. Consider the timeline for the murders. The prosecution asserts was a brutally effective eight minutes from 4.02 to 4.10 a.m. Do the grim mathematics and it works out to an efficient two minutes per victim. And each pair was hunkered down for the night on separate floors. Could a single assassin, a graduate student, get the job done with such disciplined professionalism? And then disappear into the night without leaving a single drop of his blood in the house, in his car, on his clothes, or in his apartment? The stunned cops arriving on the scene had described what they encountered as a bloodbath. Is this lack of blood evidence testimony to the killer's prestigiousness or a prod to go down other ruminative paths? And remember too, Kaylee's father had found a measure of small comfort in the fact that his brave daughter had, the coroner had revealed to him, fought back like a tiger. And yet no traces of cuts scrapes or bruises were observed on Koberger. Eight young, fit targets. And he somehow traipsed away with his pasty skin as smooth and unblemished as any sedentary academics. Then there's the coroner's autopsy reports. What was the, what was behind the delay and the determination of Ethan's wounds? The autopsy was performed on November 17th, but the report on his death was not issued for nearly a month. On December 15th, had there been a problem in reaching the findings? A final analysis that had been subject to weeks of debate? The coroner's descriptions of the wounds as noted in court documents seem to differ from floor to floor on the house. Kaylee and Maddie, lying in the same bed on the second floor, suffered through, quote, visible stab wounds. Yet on the floor above, Xana succumbed to, quote, Wounds caused by an edged weapon. Ethan's were, quote, caused by sharp force injuries. Was there some doubt in the coroner's mind that the wounds were all caused by the same weapon? And speaking of the murder weapon, where is it? The knife, or is it knives, used in the attack, has not been found. There's not an incriminating trace of a weapon that can be tied to Koberger. But these suspicions are just preludes to the bigger mysteries that keep the defense up at night. In an objection to state's motion for protective order they'd filed late in June, the team zeroed in on a few of the lingering questions. It is a revelatory document and a provocative one. They point out that back in December, prosecution was made aware of two additional males DNA found inside the King Road house, as well as male DNA on a glove found outside the residence. If the DNA had been Koberger's, the prosecution would have been screaming this revelation from the Moscow rooftops. The state's stony silence, the defense believes, can mean only one thing. The DNA comes from three other men. And so the obvious and yet very pertinent questions remain unanswered. Who are they? And how do these three unknown men fit into the horrific events of that night? And there is still another ticking bomb in the court document. The motion dramatically demolishes the tantalizing press reports that had been buzzing around the case for several months. Forget the stories about online direct messages between Koberger and one of the victims. Forget the alleged run-in at a Moscow Main Street restaurant where two of the girls worked. The defense asserts there is no connection between Mr. Koberger and the victims. And if there is no connection, then there is no motive. And without a motive, the random brutal killing by a grad student from a nearby university sure is an enigma. Why? It just doesn't make sense. But there's still another puzzler at the beating heart of this case. Namely, the eight-hour gap 
between one of the surviving roommates, Dylan Mortensen, first heard disquieting noises in the house and spotted a masked, black-dressed intruder. And when the police were finally summoned, there have been a lot of agile, emphatic explanations offered to explain away this remarkable delay. And none so far, the defense believes, have been satisfactory or have the ring of truth. Meanwhile, these simmering doubts have only intensified now that the defense has been able to read the roommate's grand jury testimony. A person familiar with the grand jury findings that led to Koberger's indictment told me with undisguised bafflement and frustration that Mortensen's testimony, quote, raised more questions than it answered. Then the defense, along with everyone else with access to the internet, watched a newly released video that showed a pickup truck leaving the neighborhood of the murder scene just minutes after the white Hyundai Elantra. Was this some neighbor heading off at a pre-dawn hour to his early morning job? A Romeo who didn't want to stay for breakfast? Or was it something else a whole lot more significant? Perhaps it was another piece in the complex puzzle that, despite the state's confident assurances, has not yet been satisfactorily pieced together. So the defense has gone on the offensive. The accumulated doubts have worked to liberate them from poking holes in the prosecution's case. And with this freedom, they've begun to explore new narratives, alternative versions of what might have happened on that fateful night in November on King Road. And if Koberger wasn't the killer, or if he was an accomplice rather than the sole perp, then they realized they had to go back to what had been previously brushed over. They had to work their way to an explanation that made sense. And the farther they traveled, according to people familiar with what the defense team is exploring, the more the trail led to drugs. Look at this, my mind is pissed and I keep running. Why is this when I hit it, always we've been stunning? I might equal you are evil, but I'm evil, and now I'm going regal. Don't fuck with us. And that concludes Part one of my read through of The Eyes of a Killer, part five by Howard Blum. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Make sure you're subscribed so that you get a notification when I release part two. And if you like this video, put your touch DNA on that like button. Stay tuned for part two. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video. See you later. Bye.